Wow. Well, again, thank you for being here. You know, the holidays are a time that, the best way to describe it is it's like a magnifying glass. That's what Christmas is. When things are going really good in life, when the family's good, everybody's happy and healthy, it, that's magnified. We celebrate. When the finances are good, that's magnified. You feel like you got enough to buy all those presents that people aren't going to use. Right? When things are going good around Christmas, it's magnified, but also when things are not so good, it's also magnified. It's magnified with the first Christmas without that person, that relative, that friend, that family member. It's magnified if, if things have been tough this year, if business has been hard this year. And so we come to this holiday season, and, and some of us, we, 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 we come from that place where it's really good, and some of us, we, we come from that place where it's been tough, it's been hard. Even the past few days have been hard. And regardless of where you find yourself right now, my prayer is that through this season that you and us as a church once again receive the grace of God, because God's grace can meet us in any place, amen? Amen. No matter where we are, no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what's going on, no matter what we've lost, no matter how hard life has been recently, God's grace can meet us in any place. And that's what we've been studying throughout Advent. We've been studying the grace of God. We've called it pictures of grace. And we've been looking at the women in Jesus' genealogy and how that each one of them give us a picture of God's divine grace in our life. And today we come to the topic, grace that forgives, grace that forgives. Now, for some of you parents and grandparents in the room, you're a little nervous right now. Uh, I know this, I know this because some of you have told me, but we, we are going into this uh, Sunday and you know, you've been watching Jesus' genealogy and you know that we are going to be talking today about Bathsheba and David. And I know that makes you a little nervous, but don't worry, it'll be okay, it'll be okay. I'm a professional. <laughs> Anybody can mess anything up, just so you know. Now, I say that to say uh, that if, if the crowd was different, if it was not as generationally mixed as it was, I would probably take a different angle. Uh, on this message, because there's a lot of things that need to be said about Bathsheba and David for that matter. Uh, but since the room is mixed, um, just I've kept that in mind, and I think this will apply to all of us. But I want to start by you thinking about a compass, if you don't mind. We've all seen a compass. Many of your phones have a compass on it. It's an electronic compass, but you've seen a compass, and we all know that a compass is drawn toward north, right? But you probably know that the compass is drawn toward magnetic north. And magnetic north, as you probably know, is different than true north. They are not the same thing. Magnetic north is slightly off because the core of the earth can change over time. And so magnetic north can be off slightly from true north. You and I in our life, we have the same kind of dynamic happening. There is a magnetic pull within us that it may not be way off, but it's slightly off. And it's slightly off from the true north that God gives us through his true word and that he calls us to live out. And again, we, we know this. We know this. Sin means missing the mark. And whether you miss by a little or you miss by a lot, if you miss, you miss, right? Right? And while we, again, have this magnetic pull in us because of our sin nature, God has also given us a true north that we are to set our eyes on, we are to set our hearts on, we are to set our minds on, and we are to pursue in life. But temptation is real. Temptation is real. It was Billy Graham who said, God never promises to remove temptation from us, for even Christ was subject to it. Temptation shows what people really are. It does not make us Christian or unchristian. But overcoming temptation, overcoming does make the Christian stronger and causes him to discover resources of power. In times of temptation, Christ can become more real to you than ever. 
And I, and I want that for each one of us. I know that temptation is going to come to you. It's going to come to your life. It's going to come to my life. But the question is, can Christ become more real to us in these moments than ever? And therefore, we overcome the temptation that comes to us. Now, the story of Bathsheba found in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. If you want to turn there, you can. 2 Samuel 11 and 12. You can't talk about Bathsheba without talking about one of the most famous characters in all of Scripture, and that is David himself. Their stories are intertwined. But the story of Bathsheba and David bring us to this place and show us what it looks like whenever we give in to temptation and the things that happen after that. But it also gives us a picture of God's grace in our life. In fact, if you look in Matthew's genealogy, you, you will see that Matthew does not gloss over this issue. He does not gloss over this issue at all. That's why instead of using Bathsheba's name, Bathsheba, he calls her Uriah's wife. And again, that's Matthew saying, no, there's a story behind this. And in that story, we see a great need for Bathsheba and David, how they need the grace of God, and they need the grace of God for their stories to continue. And so question I want to ask is simply, how does this magnetic pull of temptation and sin work in our life? How do we get to this place, if you will? I'm not going to read the text as a whole, but we're going to walk through and look at portions of it. And the first verse I want to point your attention to is 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 3. Because sometimes, sometimes we allow ourselves to be tempted. Most of the time we don't want to own that, right? But sometimes we allow ourselves to be tempted. In 2 Samuel eleven three, 3, it says, and David sent and inquired about the woman. He was up on the roof walking. He sees a woman on another roof. He inquires about her. And one of them said, is that not Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Now in that verse, there's a very interesting word that's very important. And it is the word inquired. David in this moment is inquiring. You see, because sometimes, it is true, we allow ourselves to be tempted. But you may say, but why or how? Well, sometimes we allow ourselves to be tempted because we are not inquiring of the Lord. Instead, with that magnetic pull of sin nature within us, we allow ourselves to entertain and inquire of things that will get us in trouble. You know, after this particular incident, David is going to pen Psalm 34. And in Psalm 34, verse 4, just like in other places in the Psalms, it says, David wrote, I inquired of the Lord and he answered me. But David's not inquiring of the Lord right now. Instead, David is inquiring about Bathsheba right now. It's interesting that there is no direct reference to the Lord in 2 Samuel 11 until the very end. Some people think that this reflects where David is, where his heart is at this point in his life. David was at the point, it seems, where he trusted his own wisdom. He wanted to take control of his own life. It was as if David was deluded or disoriented or he forgot his dependence on God. What we do know is that David is going about life, at least in this moment, disregarding the Lord. He is inquiring about things. Instead of inquiring of the Lord so that the Lord can answer him and give him direction, he's inquiring about someone else's wife. But look at that a little deeper, too. Because verse 1 reveals something as well. Yes, it's true that sometimes we allow ourselves to be tempted. And yes, it's true, sometimes we allow ourselves to be tempted by not engaging the Lord, not inquiring of the Lord. But also, we allow ourselves to be tempted by not being where we're supposed to be. We say things like, well, I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, it's always the wrong time to be in the wrong place. Yes? Some of you need to write that down. Yeah. <laughs> But this whole story in verse 1 starts where it says, In the spring, when kings go off to war, David sent Joab along with his servants and all of the Israelites, and they destroyed the Ammonites, attacking the city of Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. Notice that. David remained in Jerusalem. David's rightful place is with his army and with the ark of God in battle. This is the season when the kings go off to war, the text says. But David stays in the city, and his presence in the city is not in and of itself sinful. But this whole story, 
This whole failure starts with David not being where he's supposed to be. And one of the things that this story teaches us is that sometimes we have to own our own temptation. Sometimes we have to own the fact that we are being tempted because we are not engaging the Lord, we're not inquiring of the Lord, and we just simply put ourselves in a place where we shouldn't be. Now, David and Bathsheba's story goes on. And it also teaches us that our sin is not a private matter. We see this in verse 4. It says, So David sent messengers to Bathsheba. She came to the house, and you know what happens. Now, here's the thing. What's going on right here? Notice the text says, David sent messengers, plural. David is the king. David doesn't sneeze without somebody knowing it. You with me? David does not move without the palace staff knowing it. He certainly does not move without the guards knowing it. And so what he is doing and what he is engaging in with Bathsheba here is very, very public. One of the lessons for me and you, if we're going to talk about forgiveness and the need for forgiveness, is we need to remember that our sin is not private either. It's not. Not mine, not yours. And that's a reality that we have to come to terms with. But even in those moments, God's grace is present. You see, God, by his grace, allows us, you're not going to like this, but God, by his grace, allows us to realize our sin and the results of it. Now, we don't think that's a good thing. We don't like the way that feels. But it's an act of God's grace. What we see in verse 5 is that Bathsheba sends word to David and tells him that she has conceived. And right there in that moment, David realizes what he has done. The weight of that moment is now on his mind and heart and and shoulders, not to mention his very soul. Now, an interesting fact about 2 Samuel 11 and 12 is there's one major theme throughout the two chapters. And the major theme of 2 Samuel 11 and 12 is the word sent. Sent. In chapter 11, it occurs 12 times. In chapter 12, it occurs at two very important times in the chapter, once at the beginning and once at the end. Keep that in the back of your mind. But here, Bathsheba is sending a word. And the word that David receives from Bathsheba in this moment brings his life crashing down on him. Yes, he's the king. Yes, he gets away with a lot. But now he sees, he knows, he realizes the results of him not inquiring of the Lord and not being where he was supposed to be. This moment for David is the what have I done moment. Have you ever had one of those moments? Yes? There's 20 honest people out here. That's great. (laughs) Packed house and we got 20 honest people in the room. (laughs) But this is the moment where David is. This is what he feels. And so what does David do? David does what we all do as well, or try to do. He tries to cover it up. He tries to cover it up. He tries and succeeds in having Bathsheba's husband killed. There's a whole scheme that goes about this. I mean, he's thought through the details of this thing to make it look like he was just killed in battle. And that's one of the things I love about the Bible is it's completely honest, right? Showing all of this. And at that point, you would think, you know, maybe God should just give up on David. Maybe God should give up on Bathsheba. Maybe God should just give up on this whole thing. It's just getting way out of hand, way out of hand. I mean, this is, this is like stuff made for movies, right? But God, he doesn't give up. This is a crazy thing about God to me. God just, like, he doesn't have give up in his dictionary. He doesn't give up. Instead, God, by his grace, grace is God giving you something you do not deserve. By his grace, sends a gracious rebuke through a divine word. Remember I told you that the major theme here is the word sent, right? Sent. And everybody's been sending everything. We see it in verse 1, verse 3, verse 4, verse 5, three times in verse 6, verse 12, verse 14, verse 18, verse 22, verse 27. And then we get to 2 Samuel 12, 1. 
And what we see here is that David has sent, Bathsheba has sent, Joab has sent. But when you get to chapter 12, verse 1, now God sins. Now God goes into action. And now he's sending David a divine word. The text reads, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. Now the Lord, everybody else has been sending people and sending letters and sending orders and sending news. Everybody's been running around in this story with total disregard for God, not inquiring of the Lord, not wanting to know what the Lord uh, wants, what his direction is. And so the Lord steps in and sends a prophet. The Lord sends word to David. You know, I said this world is full of temptation. While we try to send a lot of stuff, while we try to create a lot of activity and things like that going on in our life, the devil also sins as well. He sends attacks. He sends thoughts into our minds, temptations to the door of our hearts as well. But in chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord has spoken. He has sent his word through Nathan, a gracious rebuke for what David has done. And to David's credit, after receiving this word from God through Nathan, he pens Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God. You know what that word mercy means? It's God not giving you what you do deserve. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. And then down in verse 16 and 17, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. David's response to the word, the divine word through Nathan coming to him in this moment is, Lord, I am broken. Now you may be sitting there wondering, what in the world? Does all this have to do with Christmas? It has everything to do with Christmas. Absolutely everything. While God sent a word through Nathan to David, God has sent the word through Mary and Joseph to us. The word. The question is, is our response that of David's and Bathsheba's? Is it a response of now that I've realized the word has come to me, the divine word of God has come to me? Is it, I am broken on the inside. My heart is humbled and contrite. Is that really our response? The whole point of Christmas is that just as God sent word to David through Nathan, God has sent his son into the world. Have you ever read John 1? In the beginning was the word. Where did the word come? Here. To tabernacle among us. And that word was full of two things, grace and truth together. Grace and truth together. Just as God was gracious to David and Bathsheba so long ago by sending his divine word to them, he has now sent his divine word to us. But not only has he sent his divine word to us, meaning in human history, God also continues to send his word to us now, individually in our lives. You know, God's word is always on time. Always on time. Jesus coming into the world. God sending his word to the world, for the world, was right on time. That's Galatians 4, 4, and 5. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, another way you can translate that was at just the right time. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. 
at just the right time. And just as Jesus came into the world at just the right time, God also still continues to send his word into our life at just the right time. Again, the question, the Christmas question is, are we broken and humble now that we've realized it? Are we broken and humble at heart because we've realized it? Or do we just mask the season with joys and songs and things that make us happy? I want you to be happy. But there is a superficial happiness that this season can give you that will be gone on the 26th. There's a superficial happiness that the season can bring into your life. But as soon as you take all the trees and the ornaments down, it's back to normal. And on the normal day, when normal gets back, the question is, who will you be? Who will you be? Is your heart broken and humble because the Lord has sent you his word? If so, then you've embraced the season. You've truly embraced the season. And that's when God can use you. And that's when God can bless you. So many times we say, God, I want to be used by you. Well, the question is, are you usable? So many times we go into the new year and we say, God, in this new year, I want you to bless me. Well, the question is, are you blessable? Amen or oh me, right? <laughs> That's the question. Do we see that he has sent his divine word to us, for us? Does that break our hearts, humble our hearts before him? Because when it does... When it does, just like all these people that we've been uh, looking at going through this series, just as we will see next Sunday in Mary's life, when our response is that broken heart, that humble heart, that's when God can use us, and that's when God blesses us. And when I want this season for you to be blessed, I actually can't just conjure that up by saying it. But when your heart is right, I promise you, it will be blessed. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, we thank you. We love you. We thank you for the season that we are in. Lord, we thank you for this amazing moment that we have together as a church family on this day. We thank you for the coming together this afternoon at four. Lord, all these are beautiful moments. But Lord, may they be moments where the truth is very real to us, just as it was to David and Bathsheba so long ago. Thank you for your gracious working in our life. Thank you for revealing us to us. But thank you for sending your word because it's full of grace and truth. And Lord, may we receive it, not just in this season, but in this moment. May we receive it and out of a place of humility rejoice because of what you have done for each and every one of us. Lord, we love you. We really do. And we thank you for loving us. I pray this in Jesus' good and powerful name. And everybody said.